Hey composers, my name is H. Christopher Lehman, and today I want to walk you through a scenario. You want to compose epic music. You come up with a chord progression and an ostinato, and you're really excited. You plug the ostinato into some low strings, and it sounds awesome. You plug the chord progression into some sustained chords, played on strings or brass or choir, and it sounds awesome. And then you play the two together, and it sounds like a muddy wash of nonsense. In this video, I'm going to talk about two tips to solve this problem, and neither of them are subtractive EQ. For this video, I'm going to use a recent mock-up I made of John Paisano's Maze Runner theme. Here's a preview of that mock-up. Without using any subtractive EQ, I have tried to use two other techniques which free up space in the mix. And these concepts which allowed me to free up this space are depth and panning. Of course, at the end of the day, some subtractive EQ is going to have to happen, but if you really cut off all of the lows from either the ostinato or the sustained pads, then you really lose a lot of the emotional weight that comes with the music that you're trying to make, and that's a total bummer and <laughs> no one wants to do that. So instead, I want to talk about some other things to try before you go to that harsh EQ cut. So let's talk about the first concept, which is depth. When you go to watch an orchestra perform live, the concept of depth is really easy to understand. The violins are sitting closer to you, the brass are sitting farther away. And so the violins are going to sound a little bit clearer than the brass, which are going to sound a little bit more ambient. Now let's not confuse this with volume. The brass can still play at a much louder volume than the strings can, so they can still be louder, but at the end of the day, some of the clarity of the individual player is going to be lost because they're a little bit further away. Now in the context of an orchestral hall, you're sitting really far away from the whole orchestra, so this really blurs together, but this concept can really be heard when it comes to the way that sample libraries are recorded, which is with the use of close mics. We can get a sound in a virtual sample library that you don't necessarily get when you go to listen to an orchestra live because of how closely microphoned the players are. So I think that the concept of depth is one that we tend to forget about because when we're going to make music, we're using headphones or studio monitors and of course, the headphones are not, you know, one's closer to you than the other, but they're both on your ear. Or the same with studio monitors, they're going to be the same distance from your ears. So it's really tempting to start thinking about and subconsciously assume that everything you're listening to is the same distance from your ear. Because in one sense, it, it is. All the source of the music and the audio that you're making is coming from the same distance from your ear. But depth can still be heard through microphone positions of different distances. And this depth of field, in the same way that we've got low frequencies and high frequencies, and that you want to have a certain amount of high frequencies and low frequencies to fill out your mix, and that if you've got too many lows, they will get muddy, and too many highs, they will get muddy, this concept applies to depth too. And so it's something to be conscious of, but it also is gives us another avenue to fill out the mix without having to worry about contrasting, or should I say, overlapping frequencies. You can have two instruments which take up a really low frequency, but because of the difference in depth, they can sound really clear in a mix. So we can take advantage of this when it comes to sample libraries. One of the beauties of libraries which come with all these different microphone positions, um, outside, <laughs> outside of the fact that they uh, take hours and hours and hours to download, um, is that these different microphone positions allow you to actually layer more things without running into a money mix. And on some level, this takes place with listening to a real orchestra or recording a real orchestra. Certain sections are going to be using more close mic and certain sections are gonna be using more of the outriggers. This is something that you're gonna see when, when you listen to mixing and mastering engineers who work on orchestral scores and film scores for a living and who are really, really good at what they do. They talk about this concept of depth a lot because it's something they manipulate because there's so many different instruments playing at one time that just focusing on frequency and panning, which is the next topic I'm gonna to talk about, is not enough. You need to focus on depth too. So in order to make this point clear, um, I've played just a short little melody on some celli and horns in unison, so they're not playing in separate octaves. And the first audio clip I wanna play you is with both of them using the tree microphones. And the second clip I wanna play you is with the celli using just the close mic and with the horns using just the outriggers. Now this might be a little bit extreme and something you don't wanna do in your mix, but I think it gets the point across 
in how much space this gives without doing any EQ. So let's listen to those. Now let's apply the same concept to the Maze Runner mock-up. For both the ostinato and the sustain strings, I have layered Spitfire's chamber strings with Cinematic Studio strings. So this is going to be a lot of different players, and it's going to be a lot of low strings. So there is a recipe here for muddiness, and it's something I definitely ran into. Now the chamber strings themselves from Spitfire are a very small section, so I actually didn't really run into problems when it came to layering the ostinato and the sustain strings with the chamber strings, but with cinematic studio strings, I definitely noticed that there started to be a lot of mud and loss of clarity and things started to almost sound quieter, even though I was layering two things together. And that's always a bad sign when you start layering two things and they sound quieter than either of the original did uh, in the first place. If you notice the ostinato mic setup I have chosen for the CSS low strings, the celli and the basses is very close mic heavy. And part of the natural way that CSS uh, comes is that when you use their close mics, they're very heavily panned to fit the natural spacing and the seating arrangements of where the string players would be sitting. So the low strings are going to be panned very hard right. So as a result of this, we've got a very um, close mic sound that's naturally panned pretty far to the right. And the panning is something I'll talk about in the second part of this video. But for now, just focus on the fact that this is very, very close mic as opposed to the default mix, which has got a lot more room in it. So let me first play what the ostinato and the sustain strings sound like on just the default mixes with the default panning, and then let me play what it sounds like when I've added the close mic to the ostinato. <laughs> I think you can notice how the close mic is adding a lot of a layer of depth that gives this an extra layer of size that wasn't there with just the microphones for the room. Okay, so now I want to talk about panning, which I think is talked about more, but when you combine panning and depth together, then you can really start to open up a very three-dimensional sound um, that gives you a lot of room to work with, particularly in this low end where you're going to be running into a lot of mud. So whereas depth is really about the distance the source of the sound is from the listener, panning is about where the source of the sound is coming to the listener related to the listener. So it's like, is it to the left? Is it to the right? Um, is it behind me? Is it in front of me? Now, when it comes to um, traditional, just sort of stereo output, uh, if you've got studio monitor headphones, we've got left and right, and that's all we've got. So we can swing back and forth between left and right. With surround sound, you start adding a whole layer of sort of 360. But just talking about left and right, we can still do a lot um, to give ourselves a lot of room in the mix. So at some point on YouTube, I assume you have run into someone talk about the standard seating arrangement for the string section and how panning your violins left and your low strings right can be a way to add realism to your mix. And that if you're looking for a little bit of realism, that this is something to try. Of course, there's a lot of talk about how you use your dynamics and your expression and whether you're giving the players parts that they might actually play. But um, talking about panning is another thing to just add a little bit of realism. And this can be great. It's something I do all the time, pan my violins a little bit left, pan the celli and, and basses a little bit right. But I want to pause for a moment and talk about why it is that we do that. Because I think we tend to start making assumptions that realism is the end goal, when the reality is when it comes to these orchestral mockups that it's not. It is a means towards an end. And that end is just something that sounds good, which sounds really basic and sort of silly, but it's important to not lose the fact that realism is not the end goal. It's a means towards getting to just something that sounds good. And in certain cases, adding a little bit of realism can be something which makes your mix sound better. In other cases, trying to hyper-focus on realism is going to make your mix sound worse. 
So thinking about this from a mixing perspective and appreciating the fact that we aren't actually working with live players in a real room, we can manipulate things to go against what would be otherwise realistic to make things sound better. So when it comes to layering a string section playing a low ostinato on top of them playing low sustain pads, the reality is, is that the full uh, the full low strings are never going to be playing both. You would have to put them in Divisi or have a massive, massive, massive orchestra, which in most cases is not super realistic. And if we had a full sized uh, celli and bass section playing an ostinato and another full sized celli and bass section playing sustained pads, in all likelihood, things might start to sound a little bit muddy even in real life, although probably less so than when you're working with samples. But still, it raises this point, which is that really we're not after realism in this case because we're already we're already past that point. We're, we're layering, we're having two string sections play something on top of each other, which is just something that wouldn't happen in real life. So when we focus instead on just what's gonna sound good, we can think about very traditional mixing advice, which is that if you've got something that dominates a lot of right ear and you've got another sound which is in the same frequency range, put it a little bit left. So what I've done in this piece is take the ostinato, leave it in its natural panned position to be pretty far to the right, and then panned the low sustained strings to the left to free up that space. And in reverse, I've also taken the violins and panned them a little bit right, and just given the whole thing a little bit of width. And all of a sudden in, in our ears, this starts to sound full. And the vision I like to have in my head when it comes to deciding how I'm gonna go about panning things is I like to think about all of the different sections I'm working with, percussion, brass, woodwinds, strings, choir, and then try to imagine that this is some sort of like three-dimensional puzzle that I'm trying to mesh together as opposed to two different sounds which I'm trying to just like wall up on top of each other because then you're gonna run into mud. Like the principles of mixing um, don't just apply to traditional pop music, they apply to orchestral music too. And if you layer too many low frequency sounds coming out of the same ear, you're just gonna lose clarity. So with all of that in mind, let's listen first to what this sounds like in its default panning. So I'm gonna play what I played, the second version of what I played last time with the custom microphone setup that I have, but with the default panning, so you can hear that again. And then I'm gonna play the version that I've panned uniquely using just the panning option in contact in the Cinematic Studio strings. And I'll have the, uh, the GUI up on screen so you can see what that looks like and listen to what this does for the sound. And remember that there is some subtractive EQ. You're also listening to something which I've actually taken the time to fully mix. So there are other things going on to give this some clarity and some bite, but I think that just these two things allowed me to not have to do a ton of EQ to the strings and get something which sounds really, really full. So let's take a listen to what that sounds like. <laughs> So that is going to be it for this video. If you have any questions, please leave them down below. I hope you learned something and found this interesting. That's gonna be it for now. Take care.